India has the source of diamond wealth in the world in the 18th century and it makes India very, very rich. Would you wear jewels like that? If I had them. <laughs> it's the men that wear the big jewels in India, which is a surprise to us in the West where women usually wear jewelry. Interesting looking at uh, gender and masculinity and how it looks so different. The court culture requires a certain presence that the ruler needs to be stand out from the crowd. He's almost saying, don't forget where the diamonds come from. Absolutely. It all started with the story of East meeting West. The man who owns this collection came here to the Legion of Honor and was so taken with its beauty, he wanted to put his jewels on display here. We're very fortunate that he chose us as a venue. It's the first time these jewels have been on the West Coast. This is the centerpiece of the exhibition, and it's a necklace made for a Maharaja. Maharajas were kings and princes who ruled over some 350 Indian states in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Giant gemstones were how they showed off their power. The Indians tended to cut diamonds to preserve weight because weight equals value. Consider this 26 carat portrait diamond. Looks like a magnifying it glass. It does look like a magnifying glass. It puzzled traders from Europe. They didn't know what to do with them because they didn't have any sparkle. India would soon adopt the brilliant cut, making the sparkling diamonds known in the West as a girl's best friend. Of course, in India, it's the men that wear the big jewels. Often, the pieces were made for women. A pendant that was originally worn by Catherine the Great of Russia. And worn all together, they were very heavy. They were very different to wear and he wears them beautifully and he really shows that men can pull it off if they know what they're doing. Court ceremonies became more lavish under British control when Maharajas no longer needed to pay for an army. Of course they still carried jeweled daggers like the emperors before them. The uh, successions of the different emperors was nearly always bloody and involved uh, the brothers killing each other. Jade was said to bring victory while rubies brought protection. They're the same stones found in these tiny bracelets. I would look at those and think those are rings for a very large thumb. They do look like thumb rings, but in fact, they're bracelets for falcons, for hunting falcons. The stones are set with a ring of pure gold, a technique that's still practiced in India today. Emeralds are a very important part of the story because green is sacred to Muslims. Most of these emeralds came from Colombia, again cut to keep them as big and heavy as possible. There were also spinels, a red stone that looks a bit like a ruby. And they regarded them as dynastic stones and you have names of their ancestors sometimes inscribed on them. Look closely and you'll see the inscription that was traditionally worn inward against the skin as a spiritual symbol. That you are continuing the good works of your ancestors. Sapphires were thought to be bad luck, but you'll find lots of pearls at one point more valuable than diamonds. And are worn, of course, in large necklaces by men. With one exception, this portrait of Britain's Queen Alexandra at her coronation. She is appropriating the male style of Indian uh, jewelry. It was no accident. Much like the Maharajas, this was a display of power. There's a very important message she wants to convey that she is Empress of India. Decades later, women would be the ones to wear the big gemstones, but in 1902, We've got a curious case of a woman being essentially in drag.